attention if his watch is broken. there in town like my favorite is reds uh, and, and there's the ground zero that Morgan Freeman owns and all out in the countryside there's places there used to be a place in Bobo Mississippi but it burned down that was a that was a wild really wild joint uh, they had a shootings in there too but uh, don't let that scare you uh, it's just, you know, historically it seems like that area around there, especially the Delta, is, it seems like that's where the blues came from. You can just feel it when you're there. And uh, I don't know if anybody has the answer, but it's, it's there and that's where it just beams out from there around like a, like a giant radio thing. It just beams the feeling of the blues out. You can feel it coming up out of the ground when you're there. It's all in the air. Well, uh, I was born in Kosciuszko, Mississippi in 1944 and moved to Memphis in 1947. So mostly I grew up in Memphis, but I spent many of my summers back in Mississippi with different relatives and friends. And um, even though I was from the hills where Kosciuszko was, I had a lot of relatives all around Clarksdale and Friars Point. My mom grew up on a plantation right near Friars Point. So a lot of people think of Memphis as just part of North Mississippi. So uh, some of my earliest memories are from the hills and the Delta and Memphis. And um, uh, where I lived in Memphis, there was, when I first, first moved there, it was a, a dead end street we only had houses on one side. And the rest of the street was all woods. And at the end of the dead end street was woods. And then there was a creek called Cypress Creek. And along that creek, there were fields. And I would, as a kid, I played around the creek. It was this where it was cool in the summer. And I would hear people singing while they worked in the fields. And that's my earliest memory of hearing like real blues. And it wasn't like the blues you heard on the radio. This was like down. I mean, it was like really from the heart. And I was kind of a lonely kid. I didn't have any brothers or sisters. My dad had left and it was just me and my mom. And she worked all the time. So I was alone a lot. And I was alone out in the woods or down by the creek. And when I heard that singing, it just, the feeling of it just wrapped itself around me. It was like my comforter. Like I recognize that. That's how I felt. And even though it was sad, and the sweetness about it and spirit about it, it was uplifting too. <laughs> Thank you. 
I met the Elvis a few times. I used to go to his parties a lot. I didn't always, I didn't go up and talk to him. Hey man, how you doing? Nothing like that. I, uh, I had his phone number. I'd call up and I'd find out where the party was. He would rent like the, the skating rink or he'd rent the Memphis Fairgrounds or he'd rent this uh, little uh, neighborhood theater called the Memphian Theater, uh, which is still there, but has another name now. Uh, actually, it's, they just have plays there now, but they had movies there then. And, and I would call up to find out where the party was, and I'd go, and it'd be free, and all the hot dogs and hamburgers and Cokes were all free, and uh, it was a lot of fun just to be, especially the, when the, they are showing the movie, because the Elvis would sit there, and he'd make up stuff about the movie. <laughs> It was hilarious. I mean, he had a great sense of humor. I mean, people would be cracking up, not because he was Elvis. He was just, these were all his friends. Yeah. And Elvis was special to a certain group of uh, people in Memphis because it's, it's hard to explain in a short version, but there's like levels of society in Memphis. And, uh, like the old families, the old cotton families, they were at the top. They had all the money. And then below that were like uh, white trash, which would be like people like me and Elvis were poor people from Mississippi. And of course the black people, they were, the white trash and the black were kind of on the bottom there, you know. Not kind of, I mean, we were on the bottom. But when Elvis got famous, I mean, you know, Elvis combed his hair like we did and dressed like we did. We we looked alike, you know. Where like the older, the other strata of society, they didn't dress like that. They didn't have the sidelines or, or any of that the pompadours, nothing. So when Elvis got famous, the rest of us were like, we're okay too, you know. <laughs> He's one of us, you know. I love blues, and I love rockabilly, and uh, gospel, and old hillbilly music, and I, I was just a music fan. And I played just for my own enjoyment, and spontaneous jam sessions with friends, sure. but never ever had a thought of doing it professionally. Mm -hmm. Harmonicas were always kind of around, and my dad gave me his guitar when I was about 13, and I got to thinking about it, I love blues so much, the way it makes me feel when I listen to it, I bet it makes you feel even better to play it. So I would go out in the woods with my harmonica and just just make up my own blues. And then I'd fool around with the guitar and try to... I'd watch these guys that played on the streets around Memphis, these street singers. One guy was named Abe McNeil. Now, a lot of the guys, I never knew any of their names, but... Uh, They'd just be out on the street playing for tips downtown Memphis. And I'd watch how they played, and I'd go home and try to figure out how they were doing it. So I was teaching myself, and then I got to know people around Memphis, uh, like Will Shade and Corey Lewis and Earl Bell and uh, Willie B. Willie B was a big influence. And uh, they just, they taught me, they showed me how to where you put your hands, yeah. all the different tunings and stuff. And still, though, it was just a hobby. I wouldn't think of anything about, I want to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. I just, I love the music. I just wanted to play it. And if I'd never made a record, and if I was working in a factory somewhere today, I'd still be playing. Mm -hmm. I just got lucky.
Dave Peabody. Dave from Hawaii. And here's Dave from Mississippi Guitar. <laughs>for the first time was really impressive. Because I was in this place called Silvio's, it was just jam packed. And I'm like way back in the back. And I can see the band up on the stage and I can just, I didn't realize that Wolf was like sitting in a chair. I couldn't see, he was, I could just kind of see his head and he's singing. At one point he starts getting up and he just keeps getting up and getting up. I mean, he's like a giant. Uh, and what a voice, I mean, he, he, his presence just filled that room and menacing. But after you got to know him, you know that he was joking around a lot yeah. too. And you know, whether it was Muddy or Wolf, let's say like, well, we got Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so up this weekend from uh, Laurel, Mississippi to see their daughter. She's working in the factory here in their business. Have a round of applause. And that, People clapping. Over here, we got a lady having her birthday today, Miss So and So. Everybody clap. It's like a real social yeah. scene. And then there's, he'd say, And we got this white boy over here who comes, comes to see the old wolf. Whether it's snow or sleet or cold or, or really hot, let's have a hand for the white boy. And you know, stand up, white boy, you know. It's, people would, and it was all in good fun. People would laugh, you know, and, it was, and I'd be laughing. and. Wolf would buy me drinks and he'd have me sit in and stuff like that. And, uh, he was great.